Can you hear me? Hey, Paul. How are you? How are you doing, Mr. Daniel? How are you good. doing today? It's, it's George, but good. Yourself. Thank you. Thank you. Um, pleasure to meet you, first of all. I just started the live. Um, thank you so much for doing this. Uh, oh, it's my pleasure. My pleasure. Yes. Uh, let me um, let me start the live, and uh, I'll get it off the starting soon, and we're ready to kick off. Sounds great. Awesome. How's your day today? It's been it's been great. It's been really good. So awesome. Yeah. All right, how's everybody doing, man? Uh, thank you for coming by today. Give me one second, everyone. Uh, can you make that uh, my audio? Yeah, there it is. All right, good evening, everyone. On today's segment, I am bringing you a staple in the fly world and some knowledge on European nymphing which has been proven to be a very effective method to catch trout i am pleased to announce you our guest speaker mr george daniel a member of the fly fishing team usa and a two-time fly fishing usa national champion and ranked as high as fifth in the world george has so much experience not just in our homeland but internationally as well he has authored three best-selling books on a subject like contact nymphing and nymph fishing and the book strip set i am pleased to present you guys mr george daniel here he is. Hi. Hi, everyone. There you are. You are live, Mr. George. Uh, George, I apologize for that. Yeah, um, no. Thank you so much for uh, being here. I know I, I spoke to uh, a lot of the guys from Project Healing Waters, and uh, they were very interested in learning uh, this technique. I, myself, I am very, very new um, to this technique as well, just uh, contact nymphing. I've watched a lot of your videos. Um, so I will, it's a pleasure to have you on the channel and a pleasure to uh, get a lot of these guys introduced uh, to this method. Because I, it, from what I've seen that, uh, and from what I've experienced, it's very, very, very effective. Um, if you can tell us a little bit about yourself. Yeah, sure. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm just a trout bum. I, I grew up fishing at age six, kind of caught my first trout on the fly at age six and just kind of fell in love with it. But uh, what I really enjoyed more than anything else was actually the learning aspect. And actually, even that age 16, when I, our family relocated into central Pennsylvania, that's kind of around Penn State. And I started reading about guys like George Harvey, Joe Humphreys, and just realized that there was so much I was missing out. And uh, I started like uh, doing odd end jobs uh, when I was 16, just to hire local guides, just because I, I, I valued information and I wanted to excel uh, at my rate even further and faster than what I could just on my own. And this was before the day of YouTube and all that. So uh, I just kind of, I, I just love the process. I love learning and I love teaching and I'm here to, and hopefully able to help anyone out that is interested in learning to become a better nymph fisher. Yes, that, that is awesome. Uh, when I first, when I first found out just about um, your nymphing at all, I was so fairly new, but I, I remember going out to the stream and stuff like that. And I was just, uh, I started with a bamboo rod. So I was just dry fly fishing, you know, and, um, my, I see my buddy caught about like 20 fish and I was to my one and I'm like, I need to learn that, you know? So it was, it's awesome that, uh, that, that you're such uh, a very knowledgeable person and the amount of information that your channel has is, is great. Cause I've learned a lot from, from your channel. Um, what what are some things that inspired you um to like take this to the level that it has become i mean when i i like hanging even at a younger age I, and that's why i think when i was younger i, I loved and enjoyed hanging out with older anglers because okay. i understood that they had more knowledge and experience and, and were far better anglers and I, i've always liked and enjoyed hanging out with people that were far better than what i was uh, in any skill set so I just, I, I love taking my game to the next level. And I think the only way you can often do that is surrounding yourself with people who are going to be better than you, because it's going to kind of help force you to kind of, uh, to kind of steepen up that learning curve and become a better angler. And, and there's nothing wrong about hanging out with your best friends and just enjoying your time. I mean, I enjoy doing that too, but right. if you really, if you really want to get better, you've got to hang with the right crowd and people that are going to push the boundaries and not just get comfortable with just one thing and what they've done in the past saying that this is the way it's always going to be. So I, I just, 
you, you've got to be in the right environment and hang out with the right people. And, and that's the joy about learning. And this isn't just about fishing. I mean, I'm, I'm into photography now. And even when I teach, I'm learning, I'm trying to learn better and more appropriate ways of actually teaching and educating. So it's always the art of learning, uh, no matter what aspect, even as a parent, I mean, I'm failing horribly every day, but still you're trying to get better each and every time. And, and that's what makes life exciting. It's just trying to get a little bit better the next time around. Agreed. Wow, those uh, that's very inspiring. And uh, now, when uh, what got you into like the competitive scene? Besides, like I know you you're saying that you always want to get pushed and everything and hanging out with the right crowd. But what was your main like your main argument in your life that was like, okay, I'm, I want this, and I want to take that next step into the competitive scene because you you're ranked fifth in the world, and that is such a, a huge milestone. So what was the, that initial step that, that made you take it? It was just learning about the uh, fly fishing team, about them opening up qualifiers and tryouts. And just, you know, to myself, it was always like, I, I want to get better at something. I always want to get better at something uh, with fly fishing and whatnot. And I just realized I knew there were guys in the team. Uh, Lance Egan was a guy on that team and still is a, is a prominent member of the team, but these are guys who I really looked up to. And I just knew that if I was able to be in that type of environment, I was going to get better at myself. In truth, I'm not an overly competitive guy. Uh, I never, I never like got upset if I was first or last. The only thing I knew I could control was actually just doing everything I can to prepare and to become the best angler. And if you prepare and do all the things that you think you can do up to that point, usually the results speak for themselves. So I just, I love I love the art of preparing. I love training. I love having a mission. Uh, and when I was working on, like, I wanted to maybe work on better, becoming a better contact nymph, or I wanted to become a better pastor, whatever it was, but there was always some goal. Uh, and there was always a stepping stone and kind of a routine that I would create to become better at that aspect. So I, I was never a big fan of the competitive side of things, but I knew it was going to make me become a better angler. And I just, I'm kind of, I like routines. Uh, I'm kind of, kind of uh, in that. So for whatever reason, competitive fishing fit with me really well, despite the fact that I never really cared too much about whether I won or lost. That's awesome. Uh, it seems like you've had a, a, a very long road, but very prominent as well. And uh, it, it's a, it, it's, I find a lot of enjoyment watching a lot of your videos. And I know uh, you just came, came out with a, a video from with full mill, correct? Um, yeah, I'm not doing too many videos. Most of the videos that you see on my YouTube channel were created during COVID uh, when I was at Penn State. Okay. And the whole reason why I did most of these videos was uh, instead of just giving my students this kind of boring PowerPoint, I wanted to create kind of an environment that what they would have seen when I was, you know, when we were in COVID years and in, in lockdown. So uh, it was just my way of actually providing kind of the best educational experience for my students, despite the fact that we weren't able to meet in person. So my YouTube channel has taken a hit and I have not done much. Uh, it, it just takes a lot of time. Uh, so yes. maybe at some point, in some point, I would love to maybe go back in there and, and put more energy into it. But right now with teaching and guiding full time and, and family, like I, I've got zero uh, time to do much else. So uh, usually the stuff that you see, like Foley Mills, uh, a good friend of mine, Dominic came down, he did, did, we did a shoot together. So Anytime you see stuff on my channel anymore, it's usually a result of uh, some sort of collaboration with a, another entity. Okay. Well, it was a great video, by the way. I watched oh, it. <laughs> I, I haven't seen it. So I'm a, we did like, I think it was a dry dropper and like some nymphing in central PA. Yes, it was a dry dropper technique. And you were just talking about how to, um, how to tackle a, 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 a run pretty much, you know, and uh, okay. it, it was very informative. Uh, okay. Well, good. Can you can you tell us a little bit about how European nymphing works and uh like what would you recommend for beginners? So like when people think about European nymphing, they think about this like complex system where you have to be like a, a fly fishing ninja to catch fish. When in truth, it really is one of the most simple simplified versions of fly fishing you can go. So when we are nymph fishing, we're fishing our flies below the surface, and usually a lot of it, anglers will use what they call an indicator or a fly fisher's bobber basically where you use basically suspend a nymph underneath an indicator the indicator floats and the fish strikes you see the bobber go under that's a good technique but 
what happens is without getting into the physics of fly fishing too much and, and the hydraulics is that anytime you add a, a bobber or some sort of large suspension device on the surface, you're, you're, you're creating drag. And as a result, you often need to not only fish a, a weighted fly, but often you need to use split shots. So normally when you're indicator fishing, you often have to use a number of split shot along with your fly to get your flies down. And usually when you add indicator, split shot and fly, that is like a, a recipe for tangles. And no matter how good of an angler you are, it's gonna get tangled. The advantage with Euro nymphing, it's just a, it's a, it's a modern version of what they have been doing for years called tight line nymphing. But basically, instead of using a bobber, what you're doing is you're using a colored piece of monofilament in the middle part of your leader, somewhere in the middle part of your leader. Uh, and the only part that ever comes in contact with the water is because you're holding line leader off the water. You're basically fishing under the rod tip. The only part that ever comes in contact with the water is like the, the thin section of tippet below your highly colored piece of monofilament, which is called the cider. And as a result, you get very little drag. Your flies are, are allowed to drop very fast. And because you're getting very little drag, you rarely need to use split shots. So the beautiful thing about this is that you're often just fishing a single fly. So all the weight you need to get to achieve depth is just the weight within the fly. So it makes casting easier. It makes accuracy much, much better. It gives you better control and you just don't get tangled. And it's hassle-free. And I think one of the biggest things for me when I started learning how to nip with indicators and bobbers it became maddening and frustrating because every time I made some erratic motion or was playing the fish, it's like you get tangled. With this technique, a bad day for me when I'm teaching or when I'm on the water, if I'm getting tangled more than four or five times a day, that's a bad day. So this is just a, a very simplified version of getting the fly down. Uh, and it just gives you ultimate control. And what I like about this is that instead of having the bobber control the drift, you're keeping the rod tip and you're kind of moving the rod tip with the fly. So you're, you're engaged. Instead of watching the bobber and just going all on that pilot, you have to kind of read the stream bottoms. And this is where like having a good pair of glasses. You know, when people say you need to have a great pair of optics to see fish, where I fish, you don't rarely see, you rarely see fish. Where you get a good pair of glasses is because you need to be able to read the stream bottom, being able to see the contours, the drops and so forth. And when you're, you're, when you're nymphing, you have to be able to see where your fly's drifting. If you're going in the shallower water, this technique, you just have to hold the rod tip a little bit higher. And as soon as you start going in the drop offs, you have to lower the rod tip, but you have ultimate control. So, and that's what's so cool about this. It's just, it's engaging and it allows you to control the depth from the start of the presentation to the very end. That is, that's a lot of information. <laughs> I'm it, glad, it, yeah. go ahead, go ahead. No, I was gonna say it's, it, it is, and I can, and I can go into this stuff for hours and hours, but it, what cool, what's really cool about this is it is really simple. Like this is, I, you know, it, it wasn't with fly rods, but I started my kids off fishing European nymphing with Tenkara rods. Tenkara rods are long limp rods, easy to cast, but this is how I got my four and five-year-old kids into fishing. Uh, now they're in the baseball, softball, and the op opposite sex, but for the longest time when they were fishing with the old man, like Tenkara rod and a Euro leader, and, and they were deadly. And it's just intuitive really? and it's, it's a very simple technique. So uh, it's not complicated. Uh, even though I, I sometimes make it sound complicated, it's a pretty simple uh, approach to catching fish. Awesome. So there, there are really big advantages to Euro nymph, or you call it contact nymphing, correct? You can call it contact nymphing. I've called it contact nymphing. I call it, I've called it Euro nymphing. Um, you know, before there was like French nymphing, Czech nymphing, but basically fly fishing doesn't have geography. So okay. like, it's just basically, it's just fishing what they call naked without a bobber uh, with a cider. So contact nymphing, Euro nymphing, it's the same thing. The only thing that changes is that you just kind of have to adjust your tactics, you know, maybe fish leader lengths uh, and all that stuff is going to basically be determined by the, the conditions and the types of fish that you're after. Uh, but basically it's the same techniques and all you need to do is sometimes just adjust your rig or your leader just based right. on the conditions and the fish that you're after. Okay. Now, um, when it comes to, when it comes to nymphing, uh, it, does leader play a huge role when, um, uh, when you're putting it together, like a basic leader, like does it have to be a specific material? of line or can you just use like for example uh like regular monofilament line but like what would you recommend for us beginners what's what's cool about euro nymphing is first and before we talk about leaders 
this is where you need to pony up and get a, a good Euro rod. And what I mean by a good Euro rod is a longer, lighter rod, like 10 foot, 11 foot, two, three, maybe a four way, but mostly two and three weights, lighter rod tips. And when I say good, I, I'm not saying you have to drop a thousand dollars, like $200, $300 for, but a rod that is designed to basically cast and flex with minimal amount of mass. Without getting into detail here, most fly rods, like nine foot fives, nine foot fours, they're designed to cast actual fly line, thick fly line that has a mass. What we're talking about today and the way we nymph today is we are not fishing even tapered leaders. We're not even fishing fly line for the most part. Most of the time we are just fishing very thin leaders. We have very little mass outside the rod tip. So if you wanna frustrate yourself and get really frustrated with fly fishing and Euro nymphing, fish a long leader with a traditional action fly rod because they're just not designed to do that. So that's why like 10 car rods or Euro rods are perfect. So once you get that rod set up, what we are doing here is we are trying to reduce as much mass. And again, I'm not trying to get into the, the nitty pit gritty of this, but right. we, we don't want fly line uh, or even like thick leaders. Basically, anytime you have thickness within the, the guides and outside the rod tip, that is mass. Mass, when it's hanging outside the rod tip, is causing droop. And that droop that coming off that rod tip, that's actually pulling whatever is in the water, that mass, even if it's 20 pound monofilament, that mass is literally lifting whatever is in the water out of the water. In order, in order to get a good drift and not have to use much weight. And what I mean by that is like the flies I'm fishing, like right now in central Pennsylvania, we got a, a decent rainstorm. So our waters are up a little bit, I'm fishing like a little, you know, 14, 16s. Uh, and this has a like a 2.5 millimeter tungsten bead. This is all the weight. This right here is all the weight I need to fish in water that's two to three feet in depth with a pretty strong to medium current. This is it. But the reason why I can do that is because my leader system that I'm using is incredibly thin and it's paperless. And what, what I mean okay. by that is we don't even need tapers. Leader formulas with this nowadays because of the modern rod that we're fishing are incredibly simple. So basically like my system that I like to use, I go, the thinner you go, the more sensitive and the less mass you're gonna need within the fly. So basically I'm fishing off my reel, my fly okay. line, unless I'm fishing dry flies, never sees the light of day. So off my fly line, I have about 35 to 40 feet of like level six pound test monofilament. You can use Maxima, you can use any sort of high vis monofilament. It doesn't really matter, but just very thin six pound test. No knots, level diameter. And then off that, I have about a two foot section of cider material, just colored monofilament. That's your, that's your strike indicator and also your depth gauge. Off my cider, I might run anywhere from like three to four feet of level 5X, 6X or 7X tippet. That is it. And that is, that is it. That is incredibly simple. And what I like about this is that base, that 35 to 40 feet of six pound test, my two foot section of cider, that is my constant. So it doesn't matter if I'm fishing out west in the east, small stream, big stream, that is always my constant. The only thing that's going to change is the length of my tippet based on the depth of the water that I'm fishing, along with the diameter, which is based on like the type of the river and the size of the fish that I'm fishing after. But that okay. is it. That is an incredibly simple leader formula. Leader formulas don't need to be complicated. They don't need to be tapered. You don't need to buy, buy in Euro leaders. And this is coming from a guy that's sponsored by manufacturers that sell leaders is the biggest waste of money. Dry flies and so that's a different story, but for Euro nymphing, you don't wanna buy Euro leaders. Just make them yourself. They're gonna be far more effective and you're gonna have a lot more success. Wow, that that is awesome to hear because I have so much material for like nymphing leaders in one of my little backpacks. I'm always putting stuff together, trying to see which line turns, you know, a lot better than the other one. So that's good to hear. That's really good to hear. It is. And and what I want to do is like, this is the, the fly casting with Euro fishing is very similar to, it's like spin fishing in many ways. Like right. you don't, you don't need to rely on the thickness and the taper of the mass of the leader. What we are doing is we are relying on the mass of the fly right here. And basically this is a lightweight fly. And if you attach this to 15 pound test or 20 pound test monofilament, like a long leader, this fly is not going to have an easy time pulling that monofilament out to the guides because you've got thick monofilament. The thinner the monofilament is attached to this fly, the easier this is, it's gonna be lighter or less mass that this, line, this fly has to take out with it to the target. So 
believe it or not, casting, the, the thinner your leaders are with these rigs, the easier the cast is going to be and vice versa. Okay. Now, when you're, when you're casting out your fly, do you, like when you're reading the water, would you like add a second, a secondary fly as your dropper or like, like if you wanted to get a, a little fat down besides doing a tuck cast, correct? But if you wanted to get down faster, like would you add a secondary fly um, with weight on it or how would you tackle that? Um, usually, believe it or not, like again, one of the things that I've really have gone into in the last couple of years, I'm fishing mostly one flies, one fly. Okay. The only time I often fish a second fly is when, because usually my heaviest fly is going to be on the point and the point being at the very end. The only time I add a second fly, and when you add a second fly with the heaviest fly in the point, anytime you add a second fly, that second fly is going to ride however higher in the water column the distance between the two flies are. So the only time I do that is when there are actually hatches or if there are fish that are rising. Uh, but otherwise, if you're trying to achieve depth, all you need to do is just go with one size bead heavier. And okay. when you're fishing these leaders with a longer rod, lighter, lighter rod, fishing like 6X tippet, like you can achieve amazing depth with just a single fly. And, and when I say that too is, again, not trying to get too geeky with this because I can go down the rabbit hole with this, but when you're fishing multiple flies, if you have ever fished two dry flies on the surface, if you have it, do this. Take two dry flies, face them 20 inches apart make a cast on the seam within a couple seconds everything looks perfect it drifted nice and smooth but within a couple seconds micro drag is going to set in one dry fly is going to get pulled off in one direction the other fly is going to pull in the opposite and basically they play tug of war and when you have two opposing forces pulling against each other the rate that they sink decreases and when you think about it, when people don't think about it is that your nymphs do the same thing when you fish multiple flies in water currents especially in like pocket water those flies are playing tug of war and you're actually decreasing the sink rate. So for me to achieve depth, I go usually to a single fly. I go with a thinner diameter tippet and maybe one bead heavier. And when I do that, I can achieve quick depth. I have a far reduction in tangles and I have accuracy and more control of my presentation. So that's just the way I roll. Uh, okay. So lately within the last couple of years, I usually, I just go mostly one fly and only add a second fly when there's a, a higher level of feeding going on. Okay, so so pretty much, uh, even even if you have high levels of water on on um on your river, you can all you got to do is pretty much just add more tippet, and j if you wanted to just uh use one fly, just use a heavier one, correct? Correct, and and again, the key with this is like going with an ultra thin leader system. It, okay. If you if you if you're fishing fifteen pound test monofilament, and you're fishing a, a small light weight fly like I am. That 15 pound test monofilament is like sometimes three to four times the diameter of like the 4X or, or 5X. Right. So because of that, you're gonna need a lot more weight. So when you go ultra thin, again, ultra like six pound test, very thin tippet, you will really be amazed at how quickly your flies sink just because of the, last of ma the lack of mass and the thinness of the diameter of the material coming in contact with the water. So as they say, thin for the win uh, and it's, Definitely a game changer. The thing I like about the thinner monofilament too is that when you're when you are tight line nymphing, there it is like if you are if you're out in the winter time and you're wearing just basically if you're like going shirtless in the winter time, like you have very low insulation. Like you're gonna be you're gonna feel every like every little breath of cold air and so forth. But if you have a sweater on, you're not gonna feel it nearly as much. Your cider and your leader system is very similar to that. If you overdress, use too thick of a cider or too thick of a monofilament, when a fish strikes, you'll see the line stop, but it's not, sometimes it's like, it's gonna stop. So it's like, is that a fish or is that stream bottom? When you're fishing ultra thin monofilament, the way that cider moves and when the fish strikes, there is a distinct jump. So your strikes are so distinct that they differentiate themselves dr dramatically from getting stuck on stream bottom. So when, when you're fishing this ultra thin stuff, when you see the strike occur, you'll see like you'll literally see it jump or bounce. There is no doubt. There's absolutely no doubt whether it's a fish or not because when it bounces, is it's a fish. Right. So it gives you a lot more confidence uh, in your strike detection when you go thinner. Uh, it's just again, it's just an enhanced sense of strike tip or in uh, strike detection. Okay. Now, and that cider is very important to learn how to read it. Correct. When it comes right. to 
Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, your, your cider is not only just uh, a way of detecting strikes, but just as important, it's a depth gauge. Uh, so like how high is, is it's off the water? It's going to tell you how fly, how high your flies are dropping. And, you know, when I teach this to like even some of my advanced fly fishing students at Penn State, you can you can watch them get into a run. And these are smart kids. I mean, they're engineers, they're physics majors, they're making casts and they're getting stuck. And then they make another cast, they get stuck again. And then they make a third cast and they get stuck in the same damn spot. And I'm like, look at your cider. What's right. the height of your cider? And they're running the cider right near stream bottom. If you're getting stuck on stream bottom every single time, just hold it six, seven inches higher off the water the next time through. And, and it just, and vice versa. If you're working a good looking section of water and you're not occasionally coming in contact with the stream bottom, just notice the height that your cider is and then just drop it a little bit deeper. Uh, but it's a depth gauge. Uh, the also, when you see your cider, uh, what I like when I'm drifting my flies is what I call a, a nervous twitch. And what I mean by that is what a nervous twitch in your cider indicates or your presentation is indicating that your flies are connected right down the stream bottom. And what I mean by that is hydraulically speaking, you've got faster speed currents on the surface, much slower speed currents on the bottom. When your fly is anchored in that soft, it doesn't mean it has to be right on stream bottom. I think that's one of the biggest misconceptions people think about. Like when you're nymph fishing, you've got to always be on stream bottom. That's not the case. Like when you have hatches, insects, trout that are fairly happy, I like fishing my flies like eight to 12 inches off stream bottom because that's where most of those fish are feeding. They're not, on, they're not suckers and they're not carp with subterminal mouths. They're feeding, they're looking out and slightly up. So eight to 12 inches, you have a soft little current. If I get my flies anchored in that soft little current, my tippet that's going from the bottom all the way up through, my tippet that is right near the surface currents, that current is actually plucking it like a, like a guitar string. Right. And you'll see your cider when you're drifting, when you have a, a good tight connection, you'll see that cider and that monofilament just having like that little nervous twitch or like, a, like almost like a guitar string. And when I see that twitch, that's telling me that I'm in the strike zone. I have a nice presentation. And a lot of times I'm just looking for that jump or the, the twitching or the hesitation to stop. And when I see that thing pause or hesitate or jump, I'm gonna set the hook. So I, I'm i always looking for that little twitch in my presentation when I'm trying to, to drift my flies naturally. That's to me, one of the, the most important aspects of a, of a natural drift. Okay, that is really good to know. Um, that's something that I, 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 I cannot stress a lot, like to the guys that I, uh... In in the, in Project in the Waters and in, in our chapter here in Winston, I, I got some guys that I fish with, and that's the one thing that I stress a lot is like learn how to read your cider. You know, I always saw that it was very important, and what, that's one of the things that I picked up from uh, watching a lot of your videos as well. Um, so when it comes to uh picking a fly, George, what what are your go to flies, your patterns when you approach a river besides like looking at the hatches and stuff like that? I mean, I think. There's to me, there's a huge difference with fish that are feeding below the surface and fish feeding on the surface. Fish that are feeding on the surface, I, I tend to be more matching the hatch, even though I do have some basic general patterns. But fish that are looking up at the surface, it just seems like they're so much more aware of what's going on and they they tend to look at your fly a little more in detail than what below the surface. When it comes to below the surface, it just this is like it's like hand grenades just it just needs to be close enough uh, i mean that okay. that is it um so basically as i teach students at penn state size shape and silhouette most of the time so if you're trying to match the hatch your pheasant tail or like your sulfur it doesn't have to be the exact same shade of sulfur so a light light pheasant tail if you're fishing like hare's ears but just keep it simple uh, again okay. size shape and and then keep it simple with that and then you know, I know you guys are down in the south, so like the stockers and even wild fish, you know, have your more natural patterns, but also, you know, your your mob flies, your egg patterns, your worms. I mean, they just they simply catch fish uh, and they do not just for stockers, but they do just as effectively for for wild fish. Uh, so I have my naturals in my wilds. But for me, I have uh, like a variation of a, a sexy waltz for my fish, a couple of variations of pheasant tails. Uh, like a little zebra midge. I have an egg pattern, like a little ecstasy pattern. I fish year round and a couple of little protagons that are kind of like mild to like flashy, like a gasolina and, and along with some jig streamers. I mean, that is it. Like 
when like when I'm looking right here, like when I'm fishing on my own, when I'm guiding, I have a couple boxes of flies. But when I'm fishing on my own, this is all I have. I have a little pack. Uh, Orvis made kind of custom made a, a larger pack for me to go in front of my waders. But I have a couple of spools of tippet. I have maybe like maybe four or five dozen flies, like four, five or six different types that have different sizes, weights, and so forth. But that is it. Um, I think the big thing here is just keeping things incredibly simple. Find a, a couple patterns that you have confidence in. And then once you have those confidence patterns, tie them in a couple of different sizes, a couple of different weights, and you are set. You're, you're gold. And then just focus on good technique. And when you're not catching fish, don't blame your fly box. Uh, it is often you that is to be blamed, as I blame myself quite a bit. But there's there only a go. few times... There's only a few times, like if you're fishing like the hex hex patterns, or if you're going up to Michigan to fish fish the hex hatch. Sometimes there are insects that have very unique physical characteristics, and if that's the case, then you can be a little bit more imitative. But other than that, some of the patterns I described and a couple of variations is really all you need. So find keep it keep it simple and find what works for you. Because if you have confidence in it, it's going to fish well. I I guarantee you that. Okay, thank you for answering that. Uh I know uh, we're about to run out of time, George. Um, it's eight twenty-eight. Um, is it all right if you can answer two questions? I got two questions from the chat, and I will let sure. you go after this. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, so I have a. The, our first question is from Landon Dowell. Um, he's asking, what is the mass effective distance for your nymphing? So usually I'm fishing directly under the rod tip, and this is why I'm fishing like longer rods, ten foot, eleven foot rods, but. I'm trying to achieve basically what they say, what they call fishing vertical, fishing under the rod tip. So with my 11 foot rod and my long arms, I can effectively fish under the rod tip, maybe 13, 14 feet at the most. But in truth, when you're fishing heavy flies, like if I'm fishing like a big mop fly or even like a big jig streamer pattern, you're going to be fishing, you can fish out. I've fished as far out as 40, 45 feet. You know, when you have a very ultra thin monofilament system, you can hold the rod tip high. And because you don't have much mass, you can keep a lot of line leader off the water. The only thing is, this normally happens when you're fishing really heavy runs because you need a fly that's heavy enough to kind of keep you anchored on the opposite side. But I've done this out west on the Madison River where you're talking about like just really crazy white water, fast turbulent water where you can get away fishing a larger fly. But uh, with a long rod, very thin leader, and a heavy enough fly, I mean, you could, in theory, fish flies out 35 to 40 feet. Uh, absolutely. That is awesome. I'm still in the 30 feet mark. I'm working myself up to the 40. So, most of the time I'm at 20. Uh, those are those are extremes. Uh, most of the time, 20, 25 feet is my is my comfort zone. Hey, same here, 15 to 20. But I still practice though my long cast. Um, <laughs> one more question. Um. They're asking, can I take a Euro leader and just add a longer tippet section? So add, I just want to make sure before I answer that. So I'm, I'm just trying to get the gist of the question here. So take a, a basic Euro leader and then add a longer tippet section. Yeah, um, that, that question got a, kind of confused me, actually. Let me see uh, who said that. Um, Ricky, uh, what do you mean by your question? Can I take a Euro leader and just add a longer tippet? it section we're we might just skip that one just because i don't understand it and I, i'm not sure um ricky if you're there just uh if you can answer me um whenever you can but i'll try to get you that answer let me uh let me jump to the last one real quick what uh, i have a question that says what's the best approach to fish what is the best approach to fish when the water is murky i mean it's it's all it's all situational awareness i mean there i mean i've i've encountered murky water um small streams large streams and i've you've had you can have a, a number of possible options so but for me typically when you talk about murky water i mean first and foremost you, you need to go with a larger bug it doesn't always mean you need to go with a heavier bug but just something that's bigger so fishing you know it could be like a mop fly but even like large crane fly patterns large stone fly but just give the fly a larger profile for the fish to see, maybe something a little bit flashier, a little bit more louder in color. Uh, but, <clears throat> you know, fish have incredible sense of vision. And even in like slightly turbid, murky water, you know, you don't always have to fish the banks. Uh, you can catch fish 
uh, dead center, dead channels, even in higher mercury water conditions. So, you know, my suggestion is just to go with a little slightly larger bug, but also when you have mer mercury water conditions, as soon as like if you're on the front end of a storm or if you're on the tail water and you're starting to get that first pu push of water is coming down, usually when the water starts getting murkier, the bigger boys and bigger girls start coming out. And that's when I tend to go right into like a Euro jig streamer approach where you're basically fishing a very similar setup, similar technique, but you're just fishing a, a heavily weighted streamer pattern uh, with a jig, with a jig hook, like a little micro bugger, but just working it and bouncing back and forth. And, and usually that is when uh, I have my greatest success uh, in murkier water, just by going to a, 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 a smaller streamer, but doing it with a, a Euro jig approach. Okay. Awesome. Well, George, thank you so much. It, I know that uh our segment was from 8 to 8:30, so thank you so much um for coming to the channel, giving us the amount of knowledge you just gave us. I am definitely rewatching this a couple of times when we get off of this. So, uh, but from the bottom of my heart, thank you. It means a lot and and I know it means a lot to a lot of the guys that are learning from the from the chapter. So, I appreciate your time and you've been you've been an awesome person. You just give no. it a share sometime. No, it's it's my pleasure. Thank you guys for all you've done. Thank you for your service. I mean, it's uh, we're we're very grateful. So thank you uh, from the bottom of my heart. And if I'm ever down in the area, you know, if I can, love to go out and fish with you guys in the water one of these days. Please, you let us know. We will set that up immediately. <laughs> I, I, I'm down there more often than uh, than not. So let's uh, let's try to make it happen one of these days. All right. Awesome. You have you have my Instagram. Message me whenever. You have my email as well. So. Yeah. definitely keep in touch we'll, we'll make it happen one of these days awesome george hey, you have a good evening thank you very much you as well thank you thank you again take care take care all right guys that was that was awesome hold on hold on hold on there it is how is everybody doing all right we had our segment with george Man, that is a, he is a very knowledgeable person. Not gonna lie, you know I'm a bit I'm a bit uh sweaty right now. Hey, man, I had I had a blast just picking his brain. I hope you guys learned a little bit of, uh, a little bit you know from today's segment. It was awesome that he did that for the chapter, and uh, I I hope a lot of you guys get some get this information. Rewatch the segment. You know what I'm saying? There's really good information in it. Um, I'm definitely taking some notes. You know. I'm fairly new to all this. I just started in August, you know, but I, I'm always constantly in the water and, and just being able to have him and, and just explain and take some doubts out of a lot of the things that, that I do, you know what I mean? From like the fly selection or how to tackle, you know, you, uh, if I want to do it with two flies, you know, but I, like you heard from him, even just that one fly, it's so much better to just um, fish it just because like it gives you a better drift and, and like it's there's a lot to learn when it comes to your nymphing you know thanks to wisdom say, say uh let me catch up with the chat i was not ignoring you guys but i definitely had to pay attention to the speaker and i know we didn't get a lot of questions out there just because like it, i i know that he you know he works all day you know what i mean he's out on the water doing his thing so i wasn't trying to take more than the 30 minute segment that um, he was he was giving us and then he's a great guy. So make sure you guys go check him out on the on the Instagram check his YouTube out I'm looking at the camera like I Had to fix my camera today so I could do uh do this segment, but let me catch up with the chat I hope you guys are having a good day, man. Thank you to everybody for coming To hang out with me, you know and do this segment Man, I was a bit nervous. I'm not gonna lie <laughs> All right, um let me see. Let me see if you guys have any questions. Ricky, to answer your question, uh, I didn't really understand your question as much, but um, if I if I'm understanding it correctly now that I re reread it, um, so depending on the on the on the on the length or depending on the um diameter of your line, like you can still go, you know, like a five x six x tip it you know like the, that's the, the length it, it all depends on on how deep you yourself want to want to um fish you know what i mean like if if it's a, if it's a deep river you know that that's a you're gonna go, answer your question you know what i mean like if it's a deep, deep river you're going to um it's a great segment george and paul thank you awesome thank you brenda 
if it's a deep, deep river, you definitely want to go deeper. You know what I'm saying? But it, you could, I, and I will explain. And I, I'll explain it to you when when I see you next time. Um, nice job. Thank you guys. Thank you guys. I appreciate you guys' support, man. Listen, I'm gonna get off of this. If you guys have any questions, listen before before we leave. Real quick, real quick. I I put a video together. If you guys have have not watched it. Please do. It's called Brothers in Arms. There's my YouTube channel right there. Last cast. If you guys right here up top right, you can see those are my links. If you go if you go to my about, I'm trying to click the wrong thing. These are my links right here. You can click them. It'll take you to my Instagram. You know, it, you can click it to my TikTok and Facebook. There's my Instagram. If you guys have any questions, any any you know any um recommendations, if you guys need any flies. You know, just let me know. Hit me up on IG. It's LastCast31. Find me. I'll follow you guys back. But this is the video that I uh, I just finished putting together. Listen, watch this video, man. Watch this video. This is a really good video. It's about the Project Healing Waters here in Winston-Salem. I, I interview a lot of these guys in there. And uh, I felt like I captured a moment in there. You know, make sure you guys give it a, a thumbs up. Share it if you guys can. You know, subscribe to the channel. But, um... With that being said, I, I am going to get off of here. And uh, you guys have, like I said, any questions, just hit me up on Instagram. But I will, Thursday, this Thursday, 6.30 p.m., I'm going to be doing a fly tying class on the live, on the, on, the, on the channel, live. So, like, we've been doing it for almost every week, which is cool. I've been, been able to catch up. I know I've been fishing a lot as well, so some Thursday have not worked out for me. But I make it work for you guys. Listen. I appreciate you guys. You guys have a great day. God bless. Tight lines. Peace, love, and tight lines. I got to get that line right. <laughs> but you guys have a good one, man. Peace.